published first in 1678, John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress is a Christian classic and allegory. The lead character, Christian, is an every man. That is, an ordinary individual with whom most readers would be able to easily identify. In the story, Christian finds himself on a journey to the celestial city, which is a trek that takes him through the valley of the shadow of death. This valley is a treacherous, devilish valley filled with demons and dragons, fiends, satyrs, goblins, hobgoblins, monsters, creatures from the bottomless pit, beasts from the mouth of hell, darkness, terror, and horror with a quicksand bog on one side and a deep chasm ditch on the other side of the king's highway going through it. As Christian travels along, Bunyan tells us he was aware of forces like mighty winds which rushed to and fro and which he feared might tear him from limb to limb or tramp, trample over him. For several miles he managed to keep moving in spite of these grim sights and sounds and sensations. But when he heard a pack of fiends approaching, his courage failed and he stopped, frozen with fear. In this emergency, reason came to his rescue, reminding him that it would be as dangerous to retreat as to advance. And so the pilgrim pressed on, shouting, I will walk in the strength of the Lord. At this the fiends fell back, allowing Christian to pass by though not unscathed. For one evil and malicious spirit crept up behind and whispered blasphemies in the traveler's ear. In this tortured frame of mind, he continued along the way for some time, but his spirits rose a little when he heard a voice quoting, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Since Christian is an everyman, I wonder, do you see yourself at all in his character. As you travel life's path, are you, like him, aware of forces like mighty winds, winds over which you have no control and which swirl around you, winds which you fear might tear you up or mow you down or do you in? Do you feel a building gale of politics run amok? of governments in the hands of unpredictable and unstable leaders, of world events that you don't understand? Do you sense an imminent hurricane, a looming typhoon of economic, moral, and spiritual collapse? Or perhaps the storm you dread most is not so grand and not so far removed. It is not hanging off your coast but it has made landfall already, and it's manifest and disruptive even now in your mind and in your life. Chaos and swirling winds of self-doubt, fear of making wrong choices, worry about not being good enough or not having enough, fear of abandonment, dread of loneliness, the burden of health that is failing, body that's getting tired, physical pain, impending and inevitable death. In a fallen world, this list of fearsome winds is virtually endless. So what is it exactly that frightens you these days? A lot of us could provide a real quick and a superficial answer to that question. For instance, if someone asked me what is it that frightens me, I could say snakes scare me to death. For people like my wife, Spiders scare her to death. Others might say flying or heights or crowded spaces, but I'm not so much talking about phobias this morning, not interested in the irrational and extreme aversions that most of us seem to have. I'm asking about your real and deep-seated causes of consternation. What is it that's keeping you up at night? Is there a situation in your life right now that's causing inordinate worry? That's, that's got more space in your head than you know it deserves. What do you fear most and why? And does your fear affect the way that you live your life and the choices that you make? Pastor and author Max Lucado identifies fear as a tool of the devil. And he writes, fear 
His modus operandi is to manipulate you with the mysterious, to taunt you with the unknown. Fear of death, fear of failure, fear of God, fear of tomorrow. His arsenal is vast. His goal? To create cowardly, joyless souls. He doesn't want you to make the journey to the mountain. He figures if he can rattle you enough, you'll take your eyes off the peaks and settle for a dull existence in the flatland. But without a doubt, the presence of fear can hold us back from the life that we want and the life that God wants for us. And fear is common. If it weren't common, the phrase fear not or commands like it in the Bible, don't be afraid, wouldn't show up some 110 times in God's own word. Fear is common, but it shouldn't be controlling. How can we overcome our fears? We're making our way through the 23rd Psalm. And our text this morning would be the fourth verse. In the 23rd Psalm, we find David likening himself to a sheep, expressing confidence in God whom he likens to his shepherd. Week after week in this study, we have seen that Psalm 23 is both a description of and a celebration of the relationship David has with God. Today, we will see that it is this relationship with God that is the key to his courage and the means by which he approaches life the way many wish they could, the way many believers can and do and should, without fear. The fourth verse of Psalm 23, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though he has to walk through a valley, he's not going to be afraid. We should notice first, as Chris pointed out to us last week, that walking with God doesn't preclude a person from walking through valleys. Walking with God doesn't mean that you're not going to have hard times. So if you're here today thinking that that if, if I'm in line with Jesus, then life is going to always be smooth, the Bible doesn't teach that. Actually, it kind of teaches the opposite, that as we are aligned with Christ, we have a new enemy who likes to throw things in our way and disrupt us and confuse us and distract us. Walking with God doesn't preclude us from walking through hard times, from walking through valleys. And we might wonder, what's the big deal about walking through a valley? I mean, when I picture a valley, I have something I think a little different in mind than what David had in mind. I picture this sort of flat-bottomed, fertile, peaceful place. And I think, I kind of like to take a walk through that. But that's not what David has in mind when he's talking about valleys. The valleys that he envisions are places of harsh terrain. They include uh, ravines, and they have steep drop-offs. This is a place where the life of a sheep is in danger if the shepherd isn't always alert and attentive. Philip Keller, in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, writes, The shepherd knows from past experience that predators like coyotes, bears, wolves, or cougars can take cover in these broken cliffs and from their vantage point prey on his flock. He knows these valleys can be subject to sudden storms and flash floods that send walls of water rampaging down the slopes. They could be rock slides, mud, or a dozen other natural disasters that would destroy or injure his sheep. You see, the valleys are not lovely and serene. They're dangerous and they're intimidating. And yet here we have David in the face of the most daunting valley, the most scary, the most worrisome valley of all, the valley of the shadow of death, saying with confidence, but I will fear no evil. How is it that he can make such a statement? How can this be? Well, he tells us as we continue reading what he says next in the song to God, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, for you are with me, God. You see, David isn't fearless because of some wonderful character trait that he was born with, some natural bent that he has. So we look at people like David, oh, I wish I could be like him, but I just can't. It's not that David has inherited this fearlessness so much. He is fearless because he has faith. Now, what is faith? The Bible describes faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 tells us, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. David believes, David is sure of, David is certain of what he can't see. Now one of the hardest parts, I think, about putting our trust in God, really doing it, is that we can't see him. 
We can't see him. We can see where God has been. As I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like when you have the grandkids over. You know where they've been. You can see where God has been. Romans 1.20 says that his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, they are clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So creation speaks to the existence and the reality of God. And we can see where God has been. We can also see what God is doing. We watch him work in our own lives. We're blessed in a, in a church to watch him work in the lives of others. We see God through his spirit, softening hearts and opening minds, changing us and helping us to be more conformed, ever more conformed, to be more like him. We see what God is up to, so we know he's here. We can see what he's doing. But even then, when we get to see that beautiful thing as God takes hold of a person and forms them into who he wants that person to be, he's still invisible. We still can't put our hands on him. The Bible says that he is spirit. God is spirit. Those who worship must worship in spirit and in truth. He, he, he's, he's not tangible. And that's a stumbling block for some of us. You've likely heard this, and I cannot attest that it's absolutely true, though from my own experience it seems quite plausible. And beyond that, it's so relatable, it's worth repeating even if it's a fable. It is the story of a young boy who was deathly afraid of thunderstorms. And some of you may be able to relate to that particular fear. So as a storm rolled in one night, the little fellow called out to his father from his bedroom, Daddy, I am scared. Come in here. Actually, one of the reasons that I think this might not be true is the kid called to dad and not mom. But that... <laughs> oh, I was always so grateful they called him mom. Because this dad would be like me, settled in for the night and wanted to be uh, going to sleep. And so he tells the little boy, son, it's all right. He gets all theological on him and says, God is with you in this room right now, son. You're okay. So there was a moment, a pause, of quiet. The little boy shot back and said, yeah, dad, right now I need someone with skin on. You see, when we are afraid, the literal presence of another person can be the encouragement that we need to endure. The literal presence of another person can be the encouragement we need to persevere, to carry on, to continue. I want you to think about some of the scary situations that you have found yourself in and how the presence of someone was very likely a great comfort to you. The person who showed up at the right time with the right words or simply with a hug. When we are afraid, the presence of another person makes our fear bearable. Sometimes the presence of that other person helps to put our fear in perspective. It's nice to have somebody talking truth into our ears when we're worried. Sometimes the presence of that person drives the fear away altogether. Faith is the belief that God, though he is invisible, is absolutely and literally that present person. When I say that he's present, I don't mean that he's present in some um, general, omnipresent, God is everywhere kind of way. I mean he is present in an active, caring, watchful way. Jesus told us about this in the Sermon on the Mount. His eye is on the sparrow. His eye is on the sparrow. You better believe his eye is on you. So no matter what our circumstances are, no matter how we are feeling going through some of these difficult things that life brings to us, Jesus promises us, and we want to rest in this, not our own understanding, not only that all authority on earth and heaven has been granted to him, but also that he will be with his children always. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So part of the key to living a life that's not dictated by fear, of facing life's trials and challenges unafraid, of walking through the valleys of the shadow of death, is having an awareness of the nearness of God. It is knowing, it is feeling, it is believing, it is experiencing the very presence of our powerful and comforting God. 
And you might be wondering, well, how do I do that? That sounds good. How do I do that? Well, God's Word tells us in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. If you are a believer today, if you are a child of God, then you know about spiritual disciplines. You know we draw near to God in things like prayer and things like reading His Word and and in corporate worship, we draw near to God this way. In prayer, we come before God and we seek His presence. The writer of Hebrews talks about prayer as approaching His throne of grace. Think about that the next time you go to pray to God. You are approaching His throne of grace. I would have to confess there have been times, even recently, I've had to confess where I feel like I just sort of ran into the throne room, kind of unannounced, kind of, kind of busted through the door. <laughs> It kind of started right away, not even actually acknowledging that God was God, but really kind of getting stuff off of my mind. Okay, Lord, I need the blah, blah, blah. And then at some point it's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, can I back out and try that again? I don't mean to take you for granted, God. I don't mean to just show up with my list of wants. I know that I can only come into this room by the grace of Jesus Christ and the blood of my Savior. I know that is my access, and I praise you, and I thank you for that, God. You're a wonderful God. You give me more than I deserve. I praise you. Now, Lord, here's my heart. When we pray to God, we are drawing near to God to seek His presence. And yes, to tell Him what's on our mind, but it's not like He doesn't know it. It's also to hear what He has to say to us that our minds can be changed, our hearts can be opened to the things that He's trying to do, that He wants to do in us. Prayer is spending time with God. And we spend time with the ones that we love. And prayer is drawing near to God. But when we read the Bible, when we read the Bible, we are opening up that Word, not just to learn something, not just to get smarter. Nothing wrong with being smart, not, not a problem having knowledge, but you do understand the Bible tells us knowledge puffs up, right? Sometimes, actually, there's a downside to being smart. You become proud. You become arrogant. In some ways, you become intolerable. Knowledge puffs up. So we're not just opening the Bible so that we can know something, so that we can be smarter than somebody else, so that we can win the Bible drill next time. Smoke everybody at Bible trivia. Let me tell you, honestly, coming out of Bible college, it just wasn't fair. I had four years of Bible college behind me. I want to play Bible trivia with everybody. I wouldn't want to do it now. I've forgotten a lot. But it, not, to be, not to be puffed up, not to be ang arrogant, but we open the Bible and read it in order to hear what God has to say, in order to hear God's voice. If you are here today and you want to hear from God. You may feel like, I need to hear from God. I have to have a word from God. Then look, open His Word. Because every time anyone opens a Bible, God speaks. In worship, we draw near to God to declare His praise, His value, His worth, His worth-ship. That's what worship is, right? His worth-ship in our lives. And we come with expectations. We don't just come to worship so we can tick that box and say, well, there, I did my duty this week. We don't just come to log in the hour and, and call it good and think that God's going to be so impressed with us. We come expecting to meet with God. We want to encounter Him. We want to encounter Him in the songs that we sing, in the prayers that we pray, in the fellowship of the like-minded that we enjoy, and in the spoken word. God is talking to us. We're drawing near to Him. Once a week at least, and it's not too much to ask, I don't think, we remove ourselves from the busy world where we spend the lion's share of our time and where it is so easily and so often all about us. And we dedicate an hour or two to affirming and reminding ourselves that God is the center. God is the one around whom we order our lives. So we literally draw near to God. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually, we draw near as we gather to worship. When we do these things, when we pray, when we read, 
when we gather. Good luck, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> I got a feeling that's going to be the ticket. When we do these things, when we pray, when we read, when we gather, we find rest in the presence of God. We find courage in the presence of God. We know that we are God's. And that helps us to live as instruments in his hands. When we're living as instruments in his hands, we're not worried about this other stuff because our shepherd has our back. But if you are here today and you're not a believer, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Or maybe you are a believer, but for a season you've not been a follower. Because that happens. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. God for you might be distant. God for you might be almost non-existent. Listen to the rest of James 4.8. This is God's word. And it says, not only draw near to God and he will draw near to you, but this is the second half of that verse. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, a major reason that we don't experience the nearness of God that we desire is sin. Sin is falling short of God's best for us. Sin is when we violate God's design for our lives. And our sin separates us from God. So it's not surprising that James, in the same text where he encourages us to draw near to God, also exhorts us to deal with our sin, to deal with those things which separate and keep us from God. The remedy in figurative terms of which James uses is to cleanse our hands. It is to purify our hearts. Or we might say it another way, listen, get right with God. Get right with God. And the way we do that is to repent this is what Jesus preached. Repent and follow me. To repent means to think differently about something. It means to change one's mind for the better. In essence, to repent is for us to agree with God about what he says regarding who we are and what we're doing or what we've done. It is to understand what the Bible tells us, that we're all sinners, that we are rebellious, that we deserve the eternal death that accompanies our sin and is brought on by our sin. We must repent and change our mind about who we are and what we're doing in light of God's truth. Next, we must ask God's forgiveness for those times when we have been disobedient, for our sin, which has separated us from Him. And this is what God requires. Not that you run out and do a thousand good deeds to make up for all your misdeeds. Listen, this is what God requires of all of us, a broken and a contrite spirit. That's what the word says, a broken and a contrite spirit he will not despise. This is what God wants, a person who is sorry for his sin, a person who grieves his transgressions and who goes to God and asks to be pardoned, humbly. And God is merciful and God is gracious and God is faithful and his word tells us that he will forgive us our sins if we confess them, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Finally, as we come in agreement with God about our sin and we receive forgiveness for it, it will become apparent to us that we have to start doing things differently. If we don't do things differently, we'll end up with the same result. I can tell you how many times in counseling people want to continue to do what they've always done and I say, if you bake with the same ingredients, you know, you're going to get the same cake. Just the way it works. You've got to change it up. You've got to change your life. We have to change. And in very simple terms, if we want the nearness of God so that we can have fearless lives, um, we have to stop doing those things which take us in a direction away from God and start doing those things which br bring us to Him, help, helping us to lead a God-pleasing life. The prerequisite to knowing the powerful, assuring, fear, alleviating presence of God that David's talking about in Psalm 23 is a relationship with God by faith. Now, David has this relationship, and he's not afraid because he knows that God is with him. And I wonder, are you confident today that God is with 
you? Do you believe that God is with you? Now, this is a powerful thought. It's a powerful thought when you think that God plus anyone is a majority. So it's important that God is with you. So David's not afraid because God is with him. Beyond that, he knows that God is for him. And I wonder if you believe that. Some of us who know that God is with us aren't convinced that God is for us. God is for you. He's not only with you, but he's for you. He cares about you. Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6 says, For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hear that. That's the word of God to you, believer. I will never leave you or forsake you. And so the writer says, we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. There's no better helper, you know. There isn't any better helper you can have in this world than the Lord. And so he goes on, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Well, that's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty bold, isn't it? I will not fear. What can man do to me? We get all fired up in church and believe that, run out into the streets and then go, wait a minute. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think there's a lot man can do to me. This is a problem. In fact, I think there's a lot man has done to me. What am I going to do with this verse? Listen, by saying man can, what can man do to me, our consciences are raised to this reality. The only thing that can happen to us, whatever man might do to us, whatever is happening to us, that man is doing to us, is either the shepherd leading us through a specific valley for his good purposes, or something that the shepherd is allowing in our lives and will ultimately bring something good out of. Those are the options that we have as believers. Now, we certainly do not always understand why God leads us where he leads us. And we don't know and can't always know why he lets things happen the way they do. But we do know that God is always with us and that he is for us, and that he is good. So whatever is happening in our lives has to be understood in that context. God is with us, God is for us, God is good. We rest in those things. And I like what Tim Keller says about our difficulty at times understanding God's will. He says, God's will is what we would choose if we knew what God knows. David fears no evil because he's sure of God's presence. He is certain of God's promises. He is comforted by God's power. And he says to God, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now this rod that he's talking about, more like a club than a stick. It's made of wood. It's a couple of feet long. It has a knob at the end. It's used to defend sheep from attacks. When David finds comfort in the shepherd's rod, he's expressing faith in God's ability to fend off enemies and keep him safe from predators. He's not afraid of adversity because he knows God is able to protect him. And he is consoled, he says, by God's staff, which you would, I would understand as a shepherd's crook, which was really more of a walking stick than anything else with a gentle curve. And it was used to guide sheep, to correct sheep, to keep the sheep on course. Occasionally it would be used to to hook a sheep or to tap a sheep, should a sheep require some tapping. But it symbolizes God's care. And more than that is the picture of the shepherd leading his flock with his walking stick. And he knows they must go through some valleys, you know, in order to get to the mountain grazing. So what the scripture teaches us is that in God we have a trustworthy shepherd. He leads us on right paths to get us to where we need to be. So, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? A January 2016 article in Time Magazine titled, Why Americans Are More Afraid Than They Used to Be, notes that we are living in what is arguably the safest time and place in human history. And yet, in some ways, we're more afraid than ever. And when I read that, I thought, that's not how I feel about things. I don't feel like this is 
really the safest or arguably the safest time and place in human history. But then, but then I think back to, to some of the things that have changed even in my lifetime. And I think, well, flying is a lot safer than it used to be. And for people like me who hate flying, that's a nice statistic. And uh, um, hunting is safer than it used to be. Uh, people may not like the rules, but at least folks aren't getting shot as much, and that's a good thing. Um, baby toys are a lot safer than they used to be. Uh, I kind of remembered riding in the front seat of my grandparents' vehicle going down the road. I thought I was driving. Apparently that's a bad thing, but that's not supposed to happen anymore. So you see, there's a lot of safety. In a lot of ways, we are safer than we've ever been, and yet in a lot of ways, we're more afraid than we have ever been. There are lots of reasons for this, reasons which I won't go into this morning, things like the fear of politics, things like the connectedness of technology, which brings every horrid possible possibility into our living rooms without our even asking. There's lots of reasons that we're afraid, but I can boil it down for us in America, I think, like this. It is no coincidence that as faith in God is being erased from our society's conscience and understanding, fear is on the rise. As we're losing touch with God, fear is on the rise. But in contrast to this fear that is on the rise and so prevalent, the hope of the gospel is peace. You see, our fear in life ultimately comes from our disconnection from God. Jesus came to restore the connection. The sin that separates every one of us from God was paid for on the cross when Jesus, the Son of God, died on us. Bearing our transgressions, he was killed. He was buried, but death couldn't keep him. After three days, he rose to life. God accepted the sacrifice of his one and only Son for our sins. And now as many as will look to him for forgiveness will be forgiven and will receive salvation and will be reconciled to God. You see, being reconciled to God is the key to living without fear. If you want to live without fear, you've got to live reconciled to God. If we are reconciled to God, we can be sure of his presence. We can be certain of his promises. We will be comforted by his power. And this reconciliation comes through Jesus. Jesus is the remedy for fear. He is not only Emmanuel, God with us, but he is also the Prince of If you are a believer today and yet you have found fear getting the upper hand in your life, let me first encourage you by saying you are not alone. That happens to a lot of us. But if that's the case for you and you found that you've been driven for some time by fear and by worry and by anxiety, then I just want to encourage you this morning to lean into, into Jesus. And lean on Jesus. And not your own understanding. Not your own assessment. Not your own diagnosis. Lean on Jesus. If you are not a believer today. But you are tired of living in fear. You are sick of living worried all the time. Then let me encourage you. Trust Jesus with your life. Repent. And follow the one who says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Father, thank you for the peace that is ours.